Hey there, YouTubers, I'm Pruitt. This, of course, is Jim Davis. And today on WebDM, we pick up with our class role-playing series with one that has a lot of pluck. Uh, it causes some to fret, but strikes a chord with others. Of course, I'm talking about the Bard, so let's not wheedle about and get to playing this thing. So let's tell the Bard's tale. Let's, oh. uh, where, where do Bard's from an RP aspect, where do they fit into a world? And they're not just the guy on the corner don't have playing his songs, don't have you know? To. I start with a bard's place in the world, particularly their social function in a game world, because I see them as this character archetype that combines sort of music and information knowledge as well as magic. Yeah. And they kind of fit into this niche of a disseminator of knowledge. Right. And that the bards, whether they are sort of a, a wandering troubadour or, or minstrel or something that travels the highways and byways of the provinces of your fantasy kingdoms, stopping in taverns and tap rooms and, and coaching inns and things like that to sing songs and, and spread news and, and, you know, make fun of authority figures through yeah. parody and satire or yeah. you know pump up a hero or a heroic narrative through through song and, and information and while they're there because they're in inns and places where travelers gather they're picking up bits and pieces from everywhere else they're spreading information themselves and they just become these sponges of knowledge that then spread that all around. Maybe they're official like that. Maybe there's an official capacity for them and they are part of an order or an yeah. organization that's specifically designed to spread this information around because people need to know it. Yeah, the or, union of town criers. Sure, something yeah. like that. Or just a, a, you know, a, a group that wants to keep the disparate parts of a, of a kingdom or a, you know, a, a fantasy state in touch with each other. And mm -hmm. so the bards are like couriers or the Pony Express or something like that where they're connecting the different parts of a kingdom through this sort of common language of music and parody and satire and, and gossip and, and story. story and things like that. Yeah, or perhaps they're sedentary and they're in a big city and they hold salons and debates and symposiums that are designed to bring in the intellectuals and the movers and shakers of this particular location, get them talking to one another, but they are the, the host or hostess that keeps everything flowing and moving. And oh, don't you know that this particular wizard is working on this sort of magical research and you really should talk to this sorcerer who's also, uh, you know, area of research and, and, and practices mm -hmm. in the same area. Like get those two people together or this cleric and this ruler or this, you know, and they're, they're someone that brings people together. Yes. And in all of those situations, the bard is at the center of a crowd of people. They're not alone. Even though they might be wandering the highways and byways of, of the kingdom by themselves or as part of a traveling troop, they're always at the center of attention somewhere or the center of a network of people that they are either bringing together or who come together around the bard to get some kind of information. Like animals around a watering well, yeah. the bard is the font of knowledge for a great many people. And that's, that's kind of where I start with bards, and that's yeah. really my frame of reference for everything bardic uh, in Dungeons and Dragons. Like you said, uh, they're disseminating knowledge, but also they, that can be just straight up through storytelling or singing, also through satire and parody, and sometimes right. that's not the best thing for them. <laughs> like Sometimes there are ramifications, right? Let's say you're playing a, a bard and the antagonist of the setting is a local lord or something. Yeah. To me, bards, like they shine during downtime activities, and in those quiet moments in a campaign where there's not much happening or a long period of time passes and the DM's like, a week goes by. To me, that's where the bard is like, why isn't the bard spreading rumors during that time, fomenting unrest against their antagonist or seeking ways to undermine the power base mm -hmm. of whoever it is that's there through gossip, comment here and there, a, a word, a, an anonymous poem nailed to the front of a door or a post where everyone's gonna see it and read it. Yeah. Like, those sorts of little things that they can do will set the stage for when the big confrontation comes, it ensures that, say, the local populace is on you know, the hero's side, mm -hmm. or that they see them as you know the heroic people who are solving their, their needs 
as opposed to the oppressive, evil, whatever it is that they're opposing. You, yeah, using your uh, uh, bathroom wall writing class feature. Where you, right. Every, every, bath, <laughs> every outhouse you go to, you etch in a, a thing about the local lord or the, or the pope or whatever. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, like, let's think about it for a second. The typical adventuring party are a group of vagabonds and wanderers who come into a location and, mm -hmm. and pose themselves as problem solvers of some kind, but they're not necessarily from that location. In no. kind of the typical D&D &D campaign, yeah, they are outsiders. they're from all over the place and they kind of come together under dire circumstances and, and go on their quest, then the bard is there to ease that transition because a lot of these villages, first off, D&D &D world is dangerous, there's monsters everywhere, there's all sorts of weird cults and groups that have nefarious purposes. You can understand why an isolated village or town or, or even like a big city might be mistrustful of outsiders, might view them with a bit of suspicion because like we yeah. don't know you. Yeah, especially if they come in like armed to the teeth with like oh. animal companions following in tow. Right, and, you know, right. It could right. be a tad unsettling It sometimes. could be a tad unsettling and there's all sorts of monsters and things that can look like other people, that can, you know, that can deceive you. And so having a bard who like eases that transition, maybe they travel ahead of the party a couple mm -hmm. of hours and announce the arrival, like brave and virtuous citizens of the whatever, you know, the noble party of such and such will be traveling in, you know, paving the way for the rest of the group. Uh, so that you can ease those social tensions and social interactions that they're going to have. Mm -hmm. Now that means you have to have a dungeon master who is paying attention to the social relationships of the places that they're creating and the impact that the party has on those things. Yeah. If your NPCs just sit in their shops and taverns and don't do anything until the players interact with them. Until they walk up and hit X. Right. Yeah. Then that's going to be less satisfying than if you have a living, breathing world where there's agendas going on and the NPCs are doing things regardless of what the player characters are doing and there's a, a movement to the whole thing then the bard is there to navigate that space mm -hmm. and to uh, make sure that the party doesn't have to deal with any of this other stuff while they're out there adventuring. And then yeah. of course the bard is in there in the thick of it with them because they're a full spellcaster and they've got a lot of great abilities to support an adventuring party. Oh yeah, a lot, a lot, of, a lot of that. Yeah. I love that idea though, like of the bard showing up a couple of hours ahead like, Oh, I'm hoping to catch this party. I've heard tale of their exploits <laughs> from the mines of Van Delver. And I just, I, I heard they were coming this way and they're just having drinks, talking them up. And then the party walks in. Oh my, it is the heroes of uh -huh. blah, blah. And then you have this fresh encounter in every right. new town you go in <laughs> that kind of eases that. And now you've built them up in the, right. in the local populace's eyes. And then yep. you're like, well, might I travel with you then? You just do that every time. You're like, oh, it might be a little tricky. Why don't you go ahead and go do the... Of, of all the character types who are, you know, equipped to deal with, say, a mob of angry villagers or something like that with, without killing them, because there's <laughs> there's a lot of classes that can deal with a mob of angry villagers just fine, but it yeah. tends to result in those villagers being dead, like <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> a fireball or or, or yeah. a big raging barbarian I mean, you, or, you, or something you, like that. If you boil it down to just brass tacks, sure. like that, then yeah, they're just four hit points each. They're just four hit points <laughs> each, ten AC. Uh, and so I think that like <laughs> you can have a character who can gauge the reaction that the party might receive if they're about to enter town. Are they going to run a foul of the authorities when they come mm -hmm. in town? Are, is there a problem there that the bard can start solving yeah. before the players arrive so that they can hit the ground running while they're there? And the bard sort of acts as like a, a, an advanced party. When the party finally arrives, the bard's like, okay, well, we've got this, this, and this that need doing, or these are the movers and shakers we should talk to, or I've already met with this person and gotten the wheels greased on that. Mm -hmm. Uh, now that presents a practical problem at the table where does the dungeon master like just focus on bar to DM while the rest of the players do nothing, keep those times to a minimum, but there's nothing wrong with having some one-on-one -on -one time. Exactly. I mean, it is the bard's job. You are the face, right? Right. You know, your bard has high charisma. They're interacting with people. They're, they're moving and shaking, like you said. But what if you're a player who isn't necessarily as glib as you imagine your bard to be? You don't have the the social acumen yeah. to grease those wheels the way that you see your character. How does, how does a player do that? So I, I, we've kind of touched on this before a bit in the, the previous rundown on bards that we did. As a player, you not being the most charismatic, socially savvy type of person should not prevent you from playing a satisfying bard. I think I mentioned last time, it's one of those weird things where dungeon masters and some players sort of get this thing in their head where they're, you can play a, a hyper genius 
whose mind is capable of bending reality to its will. You can play a character who's so strong that they're breaking rocks with their bare hands and wrestling monsters. And But for some reason, they're, that we're uncomfortable saying uh, this person is a highly adept social mover and shaker. They can read people well. They know what people want. They know the little nudges to push people in. They're a, a competent liar. Mm -hmm. And most people never find out that this person is is weaving these threads of, of deception. But because the player can't do that, that's somehow a penalty on the character. And this yeah. is this is one of those things where you're going to have to work with your dungeon master and say, like, you know, I'm not a socially manipulative kind of person, but yeah. I want to play someone like that. You know, whether or not you speak in character or not is one thing. I think it's important to describe your intentions to the dungeon master. Build up a rapport with a certain NPC so that they will trust us. Uh, my character is trying to flatter their way into the good graces of a nobleman or noblewoman that they know, you know, responds well to flattery. Again, right. you now are required as a dungeon master to have, have NPCs with flaws and ideals and motivations mm -hmm. and things for the social character in your group to latch on to. And it's not, I think it's perfectly appropriate for the dungeon master to then say, hey, you know this NPC to be X, Y, and Z. You don't think that that course of action is going to work. And until that player starts getting more and more comfortable describing their social interactions and how they approach things, it's up to the dungeon master and the player to make sure they're both on the same page mm -hmm. when it comes to a social interaction before or after the role play and before or after any roles are made, so that everyone knows what's going on, what are the stakes, and what would we like to accomplish. Let's face it, we're D&Ders we're D &D here, so we're probably kind of socially awkward, <laughs> outcast nerds. But you're going to penalize a player for being that way and not being able to be socially adept and maneuverable in the scene. That same social awkward nerd probably only has in real life a 9 or 10 strength. <laughs> right. No, that's, that's playing the barbarian. That's playing the barbarian. It's like, well, he can't rip a phone book in half, so why right. are you penalizing I, him? I know. I, mean, I, it's, I, I, I feel where you're coming from, yeah. and I, I'm not sure. a double sure. standard a bit. Yeah, it is a double standard, and I'm not sure where exactly that comes from, yeah. honestly, but I have encountered it both personally and seen it online. I honestly think it is, there are people that just don't like bards, so oh, and there are plenty of people that any don't like reason bards. to just be <laughs> like, well, how would you, like, to, to undercut the effectiveness of a bard, yeah. and that's just one way, well, uh, well, I need you to sing that then. Yeah, the, like, so well, that's the, that's. You didn't have the guy cut off somebody's head when he when the barbarian made an attack roll. Right, right. <laughs> right. Uh, that's that's something to touch on in a minute about like, do you have to sing? Are are you required to create little limericks and poems yeah, and yeah. things like that? No, you're not. It's fun if you do. Yeah. Any DM who's like, you can't play a bard if you don't sing, is one of those DMs that needs to be reminded of what the purpose of the game is, and yeah. it's not to make people jump through stupid little hoops because that's what you want them to do. Yeah. Um, that's, that's how I kind of feel about it. Yeah. Getting back to making sure that your socially adept mover and shaker type, type of character can be played well mm -hmm. requires an extra step of clear intentions from both the dungeon master and the player, as well as a willingness and a patience to let that player work out their comfort level with portraying that social character. I'll give an example. In my personal game, in my home game, I've got a brand new player. She's been playing for maybe four months now, although we're not able to meet that often. She was like, I want to be a bard. She wants to mix it up. She wants lots of skills. She wants some magic, and she wants to like have a character that can get into trouble. But for her, it's difficult. She doesn't like talking in character. It's a little bit weird for her. It's, you know, she's just not feeling it. But she wants to be, she's got high perception high or high persuasion high deception and so when we get to those moments where she wants to use those skills or or just persuade someone with something I basically ask like how do you approach that describe to me the tactic that you're going to use is it flattery how are you going to try to persuade them to your cause you don't need to tell me the actual words your character's saying just give me the a feel for the approach that you're using. Yeah, you want to you want to insult them and force them into, or you want to <laughs> challenge their pride. Or yeah, you want to challenge their pride, or you want to flatter them in a certain way, yeah. or you want to try to figure out what it is they maybe want so that you can use that as leverage. And then it's an, a question and answer. I will ask clarifying questions until we arrive at a satisfying framework for that scene. Because if you don't, and you make assumptions on your part, and you don't get cl ask clarifying questions of the players, that's when you get in those situations where the player's like, hold up, I, that's not what I wanted. Like, I wanted something else. Or that's not what my character would do. And, and really, you want to avoid making as many assumptions about your, about your 
characters as possible mm -hmm. as the DM. So like just talking it out. Very long-winded way of saying just talk it out with your, yeah. with your player. Just, just, you know, just talk <laughs> through. You gotta think these things through. Uh, Jim, how do you feel about moving on to, to Xanathar's guides? I feel good about they're, it. Let's go. Yeah. So they got their, their, th their three things. Yeah. Their three like RP hooks. So sure. the three are your defining work, your instrument, and your embarrassment. Yes. Which I, I do like, I like that. We'll, I like we'll the embarrassment as well. we'll, we'll So, so defining work, what, yeah. like as a bard, what is, your, what is your defining work? What does that mean to a bard? You're gonna need to define what performative aspects right. your character participates in. Mm -hmm. uh, is it music, is it acting, is it some other sort of artistic expression? Stand-up comedy? Stand-up comedy. John Stewart is a bard. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. I want to make a John Stewart character Stewart who goes bard. around and just talks shit about the king yeah. in a joking manner. But you signed up for a bard because performance is something yeah. that you want to embrace with your uh, character. Now, you can play a bard where that's not on the table. I have. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, it like the barbarian's rage or the monk's sort of... Uh, perfection of themselves. You sign up for a bard because music and performance is something you'd like to include in your character concept. Are you a recent convert to this? Is this something that you only recently picked up and you have yet to craft your magnum opus? Or maybe your magnum opus is a, a work in progress that your character workshops and, and, and plays little snippets of in the different towns that they pass through and is constantly refining it until one day they've released their epic into the wild. Perhaps they were, uh, you know, uh, had like a one-hit wonder type situation early on, and they mm -hmm. are riding as far as they can off of that, sort of resting on their laurels as long as they can off of that one defining work. But they're now chasing after the inspiration for their next big thing, and that motivates them. They're like, oh yeah, I had this great hit right out the gate. Everybody loved that ditty. Yeah, um, deep but blue now, something. Yeah. yeah, but now I've got yeah. nothing, yeah. And, and and so I adventure to be inspired to more great you know, yeah. great uh, works. Yeah, you can only play Breakfast at Tiffany so many times. You really can only play it so many yeah. times before he gets old. Oh, I will say this because it, it, it kind of fits. <laughs> I actually saw them one time in Austin and they played that like the third song. And they were they literally like, all right, here's the song y'all wanted to hear. And they play Breakfast at Tiffany's and then they go, all right, now y'all can go. And you could see like about 50, 60 people left after That's they played they Breakfast wanted. with Tiffany's. <laughs> and then I watched the rest of the show. By the way, Deep Blue Something, great band. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> there are many songs I'm like, that's a way better song than Breakfast at Tiffany's. I actually will check that out. Check um, that out, yeah. So anyway. Pro tip. But there you go, pro uh, tip. <laughs> when we think about defining work, is it a work in progress? Is it something that you've already mm -hmm. uh, accomplished and, and now you're you know, sort of chasing the other, uh, the, the next one? But think about it like this. If it's so popular, if what you're doing is so popular and so influential and yeah. is so definitive to you, then you might have a rival oh, yes. who is out to get you. Mm -hmm. A rival who's out to steal your secrets or who is out to uh, ruin your good name. Yeah. Uh, someone who is there to dog your every step and, oh, it's like, oh, my rival's in the same tavern? Mm -hmm. Then we've got to have a battle of the bands. Yeah. Like, we cannot let this stand. My rival is in the crowd. Mm -hmm. Not gonna, we, we've got a duel and, and you know, dueling banjos kind yeah, of situation. You, you get there and you find out, like, wait a minute, I'm opening for him? Oh, and then you got to get up there and you got to rip the house down. Yeah, and be like, yeah, follow that bitch. Yeah, yeah you know exactly. <laughs> that's some like Amadeus Mozart kind of stuff. Yeah, that's uh, that's the kind of you, thing that we're looking at here. You to, know, to create rivals, and this is how you build a rich, full campaign. You've mm -hmm. got your big plot. You've got the thing that's going to happen, and your kingdom's going to be destroyed or whatever. Yeah, but you've got these other little threads that you just weave in and out occasionally. It doesn't always need to be the bard spotlight. But when you do shine the spotlight on them, draw from their character's background. Think of the implications of what their character's background means for your setting. If they are a bard that performs and people mm -hmm. know them, that means people don't like them. There's always somebody out there. Yeah. People put thumbs down on our videos, yeah. right? Like they just we average do about six it. to eight. I accept the thumbs down. We are yeah. not for everybody. No. But you accept that when you perform and you put yourself out there that there are going to be people who do not like you mm -hmm. and use that for your bard. What if it's a monstrous rival who's like, yeah, I cannot stand this bard that, mm -hmm. and, and the beautiful music this bard makes makes my world a living hell. And, just, yeah. <laughs> and they are out there to destroy yeah. this thing of beauty that the bard is creating. <laughs> oh no, I'm, like, now I'm thinking of like a bard that starts out in a small village, like maybe next to a mountain. 
and they play in the tavern every night, and that music drifts up the mountain to the orcish, orcish whatever yeah, yeah. in the cave. It's just, oh, it's just like I just hate it. I go out hunting every night, and the music just drives the game away. <laughs> and all I want to do is and they be, that becomes the focus. Well, I got to end that bar. Isn't this why the Grindle attacks the the hall in in Beowulf because they're having too much of a good time? Yeah, and the noise that they're making there is offensive to the Grindle's mm-hmm. ears. He's just got to come in and rip them all to pieces and eat them up. And it's been a while since I read Beowulf, so I could be really wrong about that. But <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to pretend that it's been way too long. Or perhaps it's different. Perhaps the rival is envious and possessive and jealous, mm-hmm. and it's like, that bard, that's my bard. You, I'm going to take them, mm-hmm. and I'm going to keep them in my castle, in my cloud castle in the sky, where they will sing for me and forever. And only me. And only. And this is where like genies and dragons and fey who come across your bard are going to be like, well, I'm not going to kill you but you're going to sing for me for the rest of your life. Yeah, it, it's a it, that, it's a total way like if they they're down in town and they make they roll a 20 on that performance check. Oh yeah. And there was a dragon polymorphed into a human. Who's heard it or something. And then yeah. that's just hearts form around that bard. <laughs> yep. And then the bard wakes up and they're in a cave. Yeah. Like, what happened? Where am I? I'm sorry. Yeah. The last thing you want is a dragon that's fallen in love with you. Uh-huh. Right? <laughs> like, that's the last thing that you want. Or in, or a fey lord or, uh-huh. or lady who are just who's just like, oh yeah, you are a beautiful mortal. Uh-huh. Like, come and sing and dance for my, my court. And, and then after playing for eight months straight uh, right, with no yeah. break. With and no your, break. Your fingers are bleeding. Uh-huh. Like, uh-huh. That's not a good place that's for your bar to be That's not a good in. place for your bar. Now, you, now that's a rescue mission uh-huh. and a whole bunch of other stuff. There's obviously a lot packed into the defining work and I think it's it's one of the options that Xanathar's gives you that I think is really rich with possibilities mm-hmm. is that defining work written down that means it can be stolen that means it can be copied that means a rival can run around performing it claiming it as their own the instrument is is another one of those that can be a defining feature of a bard is mm-hmm. it made from an exotic material or in an unusual shape an heirloom item an heirloom item that's part of their past the big question that I that I have there is less like role playing focused and more what to do when the player comes up with the concept. This instrument is part of my character's past. It has meaning and significance to them. But that magic item, musical instrument that we just got is really awesome. Mm -hmm. When that happens, how do you replace a piece of equipment your character starts with that has significance with an upgrade that mechanically is better but doesn't have that resonance with them? Guy with the two lutes. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And so there there are ways to enchant... Uh, a musical instrument that yeah. that's different than just giving them a new one. Maybe yeah. their musical instrument is blessed by a spirit of music and beauty and, and performance. Uh, Lilins are like that. They're a type of celestial that look like a winged snake woman that are sort of foster creativity and, and wherever mm-hmm. creative pursuits are found, their, the, a doorway to their realm is nearby. Yeah. Their realm being the infinite staircase. Yeah. Perhaps it's a spirit like that, that that blesses the bard or blesses the bard's instrument. It could be that. It could be enchanted by any number of magical beings. Or it could just be that the bard's natural ability, mm-hmm. their connection with music and magic and knowledge, produces a... I'm spitting again. Um, it happens. It produces a, a magical effect that it imbues mm-hmm. the magic into the instrument. Or the magical instrument was always magical. And, and they it just, just had to get good enough to, to unlock good at it. it. Right. They had to be good enough to be worthy of the magic of the instrument. Right. Also, I love the idea of going back the dragon who, who, uh, who <laughs> gets the bard in that rescue. They maybe like do a counter charm or something so well that a muse descends. Yeah. And their playing is so, like bursting forth of creativity yeah. uh, is so much so that they're like, oh, I'm going to bless your item. Because I yeah. mean, if you roll a magic item in a dragon horde and the bard's there doing something awesome, you know, the dragon breathes fire, now the thing does a thing. The thing does I mean, a thing, yeah. It, it, There's a lot it, of different ways than just like so, replacing an item. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, last but not least is the embarrassment. The embarrassment. What, like, who did the bard <laughs> sleep with and had to leave town? You know what I mean? They, like, this, this could so be many. Any, any number of things. Yeah. A bad performance oh, that broke three strings. Yeah, that's in the first just song. like, <laughs> yeah, that just dogs them and they just cannot get over it. Or uh, a very impressive performance, but the aftermath, you know, they were caught with someone they weren't supposed to. You know, mm-hmm. you can imagine a bard. Uh, you know, they're a wanderer. They're they're they love beauty and performance, and they bring that into the dreary lives of the peasants that mm-hmm. that come to these performances and hear them. And you and you can see where uh, you know amorous trysts and affairs and things like that might happen. And there's always jealous uh, spouses and jealous lovers, and all of those kinds of things can be. 
Uh, and I'll be honest, there's not enough sex and romance in Dungeons and Dragons, and I, it's great fodder for adventures. And Dungeon Masters should use uh, more of it. And a bard is a good way to introduce some of that, yeah. because they're an enticing, exotic character. Yeah, and, and I mean, people will pursue them yeah. and seek them out. And obviously, you know, talk with your players about exactly when you want to cut to black. I yes. mean, you don't have to. It doesn't have to be pornographic. <laughs> porno here. I mean, Unless that's the kind of game you're playing. Yeah. In which case, more power to you. Or you could be the bard that you're the one that plagiarized something. And you took someone else's magnum opus. Yeah. Because, you know, you heard it one time, it was just somebody in a bump up nowhere. I'm just sampling. Yeah. I'm just, it's just a sample. It's just a sample. <laughs> you mentioned earlier in the show. Yeah. That the bards, they, they're a culmination of these three things. The, yeah, these, these three kind the magic, of... magic knowledge and music. Yeah, these three things define the bard for me. Yeah. Music is one of those that I think is the biggest contention for a lot of people. When you yes. see people that they don't like bards, mm -hmm. you hear things like, well, it's really stupid that someone would bust out a mandolin in the middle of a dank dungeon yeah. while while we're knife fighting with a bunch of bugbears right, right. and play a jaunty little ditty on their on their tiny little stringed instrument. Yeah. Yes, that image is stupid. Yeah. Sometimes. Sometimes it's kind of interesting. Well, I mean, but, I, I, I was going to say <laughs> if you're in the middle of all that, I'm sorry, and then somebody just was in the back just like well, we've singing all seen, about we've it. We've all seen that meme of somewhere in you know where the guy's with the acoustic guitar and he's in, he's in the he's the last in a stack where yeah. there's like a bunch of other operators with their guns behind him and that's one thing. And I will admit that the poofy sleeved, floppy hat wearing, prancing bard mm -hmm. in the brutal, grim uh, edge of our you know we're fighting for our lives mm -hmm. uh, type of Dungeons and Dragons. There's an incongruity there. Yeah. But you're not going to convince me at all that music does not belong in combat. Right. You are not. Because whether it is music that helps soldiers stay in step and stay in formation and, and uh, you know, provides a cadence and a rhythm to the battle, or it's music designed to get you pumped up and to focus on the fight and mm -hmm. to just keep your adrenaline pumping, music has a place in violence. It's been used it has throughout been history. Used, right? You're blaring war horns to intimidate the enemy. Right, war but horns, in, uh, war drums, a dirge. Uh, the haka, the New Zealand, mm -hmm. like we're, I mean, what is that? They're doing a cadence and a dance to scare the shit out of people. Right, or to get themselves pumped and up to get to themselves fight. pumped up. Uh, and it has to mean, mean something because what the New Zealand team, uh, their, uh, the, the New Zealand Australian football team is like undefeated or some shit as they do this haka. <laughs> and as the other team's sitting over there like, and this is what I was going back to is like, if they're doing that right before fighting, like you might be like, these fuckers are these, crazy. Well, and, and they have a system. They yeah. know what's going on. You know yeah. that you're fighting a, a group of people who are... In perfect unison. Yeah, in perfect unity unison. And, yeah. and harmony there in, in this violence. And right. it's, that might be a tad unsettling. It could be a tad unsettling. And so it is worthwhile to think about how your bard's instruments, mm -hmm. maybe they have different instruments for different situations. Mm -hmm. And the delicate harps and lutes and stringed instruments that require precision and skill and are delicate in and of themselves, they come out in the taverns. Yeah, but West. when you're down in the dungeon, it's drums and horns yeah. and percussion and rhythm. Yeah. And it's something more primal and, and it's like the blood flowing through your body and the bard is in the back getting you ready for that, slinging spells, offering inspiration, yeah. shouting out encouraging words. That's where I see the bard in the action. Yeah, you, you, you can't tell me that you can watch the scene in Apocalypse Now where the helicopter are flying in and right. literally turns on the, the ride of the Valkyries because it scares the shit out of them. Right. And it's just, <laughs> and it's just like, they it's like what the hell? Yeah. I mean, like that's what we're talking about here, yeah. right? And then there's a, there's a place for the bard after a fight, right? This yeah. uh, If you've played the video game Darkest Dungeon, part of the reason why you bring the, the bard analog that's in that video game along is because after a fight, you got to reduce your stress. You got to heal up. And the Chill. bard is also there, to be, if, if you take these characters seriously, if you take them as, uh, you pretend that they're real people, mm -hmm. you pretend that they inhabit a real place, then something like a series of five or six brutal fights in a dark dungeon where your life is on the line, the, the long rest that's coming after that is gonna, there's, <laughs> there's probably gonna be a lot of de-stressors. 
going on and a lot yeah. of characters and and I think I I find that the role players who factor that into their role playing descriptions post fight who are like yeah my character does this after a battle or this is their ritual to de de stress or mm -hmm. or something that the bard has a place there in providing soothing music that's the song of rest that they get that they you know you heal a little bit extra whenever you rest uh, with the bard that that's where that kind of stuff comes yeah. in and it's time to cool down it's time to forget the fact that our lives were just on the line and celebrate the fact that we are alive and we overcame our enemies mm -hmm. and those are the kinds of moments where a bard's music and their performance comes in and it doesn't have to be music you can recite epic poetry you can uh, just mock tell jokes the enemy. you can tell jokes you can mock the enemy vicious mockery is obviously a part of this but just mm -hmm. like taunting and mocking and what a bunch of scum what a bunch of incompetent your weak sword arms and mm -hmm. your battered shields will never stand against us that kind of thing is yeah, a way yeah. to uh, a battle bard oh, oh totally sure. totally uh and and moving in into the the magic of yeah it, like 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 how does that manifest itself you know, yeah. Like, how did you get that magic? Like, is it, you know, did you go to a college? Did you, you know, yeah. like, how does it come out? So there's three primary charisma casters, bard, sorcerer, and warlock. The sorcerer, had, they were born this way or an event unlocked magical potential that's inside them and their mastery of themselves leads to mastery of the magic that's within them, etc. The warlock compacts with extra planar entities in mm -hmm. order to gain strange and wonderful powers that they then use through force of will and personality themselves. But the bard is one of those where they're a charisma caster, I think, not because it the demands of the story, but because they're a charisma class. Their abilities are factored around charisma-based skills, they're a social character. It makes sense that charisma would be the primary stat for a bard. And this is one of those things where I would allow a player to do this where they might say, I, I want my spell casting only to be intelligence-based. Everything else can be based on charisma. Mm -hmm. You're more of a storyteller. You're more of a storyteller. You collect stories, and in the collecting of those stories, you collect magic snippets. And you learn magic by drips and drabs, and you're a dabbler at first. Uh, you know, Part of 5th edition uh, in making bards full spellcasters sort of gets rid of that bards as the dabbler, the... the the sort of jack of all trades. I know a little bit of magic, a little bit of skills, a little bit of something else. Elevates them to full casters, but it's worthwhile to think like, how did you learn those things? Mm -hmm. How did you learn the magic? And I think an intelligence-based casting for a bard really signifies like, I collect little bits and pieces, yeah. and over the course of that, I put them together. Maybe I, ha I found an old wizard spell book here, a couple of spell scrolls there, maybe a prayer book over here. I'm, I'm collecting magic from different traditions and bringing it together mm -hmm. in a way that makes sense for me. Mm -hmm. That's that's my case for an intelligence-based caster bard, right? Like Aesop's fables, like you have a bard that is Aesop, just collecting yeah. all these stories and those are his spells. And out of those stories That's comes the type of magic. Opus. Right, it's also the magnum opus. Maybe it's their book of, 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 of stories that they tell that becomes mm -hmm. a, a kind of pseudo spell book. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to have the intelligence base. You can do all of this with just charisma, but it's worthwhile to think of where does your magic come from? What does it look like? Is it tied into your magic? When you cast a spell, are, is your magical is your musical instrument part of your focus or, or, or the, mm -hmm. the way that you channel magic? Um, do you sing, and then the the music of 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 creation wills the spell into existence, and you know a certain type of music or a certain type of uh, language that you can speak in mm -hmm. that unlocks that magic. You don't have to study it. You don't have to have it within you. You don't have to go deal with an extra planar entity or a god. Yeah. You just like there's a magic. In in music and you know a secret to yeah. it that others don't you, that you can then conjure those effects. yeah you know the exact note to pluck the vibration well, the, the, let's not even get into the vibrational music just like oh I can yeah beat this drum a certain way or well or I mean strum I, this instrument I just think of uh, what is it Kung Fu Hustle <laughs> where they fight at the slums and you have the, the three people playing the, 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 I can't remember the name of the actual Japanese instrument. Oh yeah, I don't know either. Uh, but it's the big long lap guitar thing. Uh -huh. They're, and it's just ripping things apart. Yeah. I mean like, th there you go. There you go, that's an inspiration right there. You know, thinking about what it, what it looks like when it manifests and how they came by it. Where'd you get that bard. Where did you get that knowledge? They're called bard colleges. The College of Glamour, the College of Lore, the College of Valor, um, and others besides. And it's worthwhile to think, are those literal colleges 
that a prospective bard goes to to learn their magic, to learn the knowledge that they will need when they go out into the world and and help others and, and bring beauty and joy into their lives and, and spread information. Uh, are they more... Um, metaphorical colleges right. where it's not a literal place that you go but it is instead a sense of camaraderie and brotherhood amongst other bards yeah you went to the school of hard knocks right and you know. yeah there's no physical location for it but there's a common language a common uh, understanding and when you when two bards meet each other on the road it's you know practice to you know spend the evening together exchanging stories and notes and and performing together or something like that because mm -hmm. you are part of the same uh, fraternity or fellowship of of like-minded individuals. Mm -hmm. and I think it's worth thinking about that because what the place is it a literal college or is it a metaphorical college? Is it you know is there an org, a formal organization for bards or is it more just a loose affiliation? If anything, all of those things, the answers to those questions, and uh, will help the player understand what kind of magic they have, mm -hmm. what kind of knowledge they have, and then it lets them, you know, that that thinking and churning and brainstorming for your character when uh, when interacted with the DM setting and you've got a session zero or pre-game talk and you're like, I want this, this is how I see my character, and then you start mm -hmm. to build up things. And in that building up, you're also giving the Dungeon Master ammunition to use to integrate your character into the wider world that they're creating. Oh no, uh, yeah. shit, Game of Thrones, man. Ramsey Bolton, when he took Winterfell, and uh, the guys come up and they're just blowing a horn all night. Yeah. And I will kill. Or, uh, yeah, <laughs> Ramsey Bolton comes up, and yeah. Theon Greyjoy's like, oh, and I will give a hundred gold to whoever kills that fucking horn player. <laughs> right. You know? okay. Yeah. People hate bards, yeah. you know? And <laughs> I, I think it's one of those things where in order for the kind of plots and schemes that a bard is good at to play out, it takes time. And if, you, if you're playing the style of D&D &D that's just like, go, 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 kick down the door, long rest, short rest, go, 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 next encounter, next encounter, and you don't give time for bards to work their magic, which mm -hmm. is slow, and and I'm talking like not just spells, but like their what the bard does best requires time. In order to switch a, a, an NPC from being a someone that mildly distrusts the party to a staunch ally, yeah. that takes time. It takes the bard character and and the rogue player and all the others, the party working in conjunction, to allow the bard to work little by little to bring that NPC around. We're talking about music as psychological warfare. It's the same thing. It's like, oh, we've got to go against those orcs that are up in the hills. Then we can start that by, by, by trying to psych them out. By playing a song. By playing scares a song. Them or, or it scares, it scares them or something or like that. Or drives them nuts. Or drives them nuts. Or just like whips them into such a frothing frenzy that you can draw them into a trap. Yeah. Or, or make them do something stupid or foolish. Yep. Yeah. Or you, you, know, you finally figured out that spell that is the brown note. The, the brown note. make people <laughs> shit themselves. Sonic like, attack. Oh, oh, God. Oh. You, know, you know, that's your stunning attack. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot you can do with rival. I mean, in almost any of these classes, we could talk about a specific rival, whether it's like a fighter's rival who just like, no matter what, they... Mm -hmm. I remember the Harvey Keitel, the duelist? Do you remember that one where it's like the three or four duels across these two cavalry officers' lives that they they go through? You can do something like that with a fighter where it's like, yeah, I, there's a guy who I just, we can't stand each other, and when we meet, we have to fight. Mm -hmm. Like, we just can't not, but every time something prevents one or the other of us from finishing it. Yeah, you know, mal and patience. Yeah, and, and firefly. Uh -huh. Did yep. she shoot you once? Everybody's making a fuss. <laughs> 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 so rivals are one, but I think something like a bard of rival works really well because oh, you well, could be a rival that's like not trying because it's a rival that's not trying to kill them. Tupac and Biggie. I mean, come on. Yeah, like they are literally bards that are ri that were rivals. rivals. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, no, yeah. That, yeah. yeah. He, he hates all that joyous noise coming up. Uh, There's plenty of monsters that hate beauty and truth in Dungeons and Dragons, and the bard represents beauty. We were talking about Grendel, where he's like tuned to hate joy. Yeah, like joy is hateful and scary, yeah. and, and sounds yeah. out of tune for him. Yeah, it sounds discordant. Insane, and so he has to lash out and kill it. Yeah, mm -hmm. someone's having a good time. I gotta go stop them. Yeah. Right. <laughs>